like to open the uh, Santa Fe City Council meeting of Monday, December 16th, 2019, and ask you to join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Thanks everyone and good evening. Uh, let's see, we would not meet in closed session and so we, uh, we shall go directly into the time for public expression, an opportunity for you to address us on any matters that are not on this evening's agenda. Um, matters of interest or, or concern or perhaps recommendations to us, we may all welcome. Uh, since they're not on the agenda, your comments uh, will not be able to take any action on the, uh, the comments, but certainly of interest and in, may lead to action in future meetings. In any case, with that, we'll start with Gabriel uh, Spellberg from the Legal Aid of Marin. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Phillips. Good evening, council members. My name is Gabriel Spellberg. I'm a staff member at Legal Aid of Marin. I am here tonight commenting to make you aware of what is going on at Marina Gardens, an apartment complex in the Canal neighborhood. If you are a tenant or a member of Marin Organizing Committee, please stand up. Si usted es un inquilino, please uh, parase. <coughs> Last year, uh, new owners purchased the building and proposed a large rent increase to these tenants. This council and Mayor Phillips listened to the tenants, helped enact new renter protections, and helped in negotiating a new settlement with the owners. The current situation is this. Tenants of Marina Gardens have paid two rent increases and have a third rent increase scheduled for January 1. The total rent increase would, for most tenants, be a 40% increase in the space of one year. For some tenants, it's as much as 60%. However, the owners has, have, as of yet, not repaired these apartments. Tenants continue to live in apartments with windows that don't close, which lets in water, causing mold to grow, doors that aren't secure and won't lock, rusty nails sticking out, piles of wood among the premises where their children are playing, and infestations of cockroaches and bedbugs, among many other problems. These issues have all been relayed to the owner via letter in October of this year. The tenants, Marin Organizing Committee, and Legal Aid of Marin, now a part of Marin Organizing Committee, are here today to ask you, the City Council, for the City of San Rafael to help us. Yes, tenants have rights on paper, but they are not simple to enforce. We are asking to meet with you, Mr. Mayor, to discuss this issue, and we are asking for the City's help to resolve this. Uh, now you will hear from a few tenants who would like to share their stories regarding the rent increases and the habitability issues they are facing. Thank you. And I understand you'll interpret uh, for us, so we'll give you not two minutes, but four. Thank you. Thank you. Muy buenas noches. Vengo en representación de la comunidad de San Rafael en el edificio Marina Garden 137. Soy un anquilino más y... Queremos hacer una invitación al consejo, al señor alcalde, de ver de qué una manera se los puede ayudar, porque este año se los hizo un aumento de 700 dólares y nosotros hemos cumplido, estamos cumpliendo con el aumento al señor propietario, el cual el señor propietario no ha cumplido con nosotros. Okay. So. Um, he is a tenant, um, he is representative of San Rafael. He has come here tonight to speak to you and to the city council regarding what's going on. He's paid a rent increase of $700 and he has followed the terms of the settlement agreement. Sí, no, nosotros hemos pedido por favor a, la, a los señores propietarios que se los cumpla con, con lo que ellos los hicieron firmar un contrato y ellos no, se los ha, no los han cumplido nosotros. Nosotros estamos cumpliendo con, con el aumento que ellos han pedido, el cual no ellos lo están cumpliendo. Eh, en este caso, nosotros personal, eh, 
se, le, le hemos pedido que se los reparen los apartamentos porque están deteriorados. Tenemos una ventana quebrada, hemos pasado por cinco días de lluvia y ellos no han, no han colaborado, no han arreglado las ventanas y se está metiendo la lluvia. Pues. So, we have paid our portion of the rent. We have complied with the settlement agreement. The owners have not complied with the settlement agreement. They have not repaired the issues that are in our apartments. For example, the rain has been falling for five days. They have not come to fix our window, which is letting water in, uh, into our apartment. Les pedimos humildemente, por favor, si los pueden ayudar a ver de que una manera los propietarios pueden cumplir con los contratos que se han firmado y lo cual nosotros como inquilinos estamos cumpliendo con los aumentos. So we ask you, City Council, to please help us. Help us by pressuring the landlord to follow through with his part of the contract or with their part of the contract that they signed and they agreed to. We're following our part. We need your help to help them, to make them follow their part. Si nosotros dejamos de pagar, eh, se los está amenazando de que los van a desalojar del, de los edificios. Nosotros estamos cumpliendo con los aumentos y humildemente les pedimos que por favor los ayuden para que ellos puedan cumplir con las reparaciones de los, de los apartamentos. Um, so, we're again, we're asking for your help to um, help them or to make them do the repairs in our building and to help us not get evicted in the process. And we humbly ask your help. And, and thank you for your uh, your comments and, and your input. Uh, thank you so much. And I believe you have one other. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, gracias. Nos nosotros creo que hasta este momento se los ha hecho bien difícil poder llegar uh, para poder pedirles que esa, esa ayuda, porque nosotros estamos tratando de tratando todo este tiempo, todo este año hemos tratado de buscando la manera de ver de qué manera se los ayuda porque estamos ya cansados de pedirles por favor de que los que los reparen los apartamentos. Gracias. Thank you. So we we thank you very much and um we've been trying really hard to get help to make this happen. So we ask your help because no one else is listening to us. Well, uh, thanks for coming this evening. Um, were you going to speak or, or not? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Daisy Reyes y vengo del 129 de Canal, apartamento 206. Esta noche estoy aquí para, en primer lugar, les agradecemos que nos dediquen un poquito de su tiempo para escuchar nuestros problemas. Eh, solo quisiera expresarles que nosotros en el lugar que vivimos creo que no es un lugar digno de tanta renta que nos están cobrando. Por ejemplo, en mi apartamento la estufa no funciona en lo más absoluto, ya no puedo cocinar en el apartamento, la ventana uh, está rota, uh, se está inundando de agua. Hi, my name is Daisy um, from uh, apartment 129. Um, and, uh, Thank you very much for hearing us. Um, currently, um, she, she wants to let you know, um, the apartment that she's living in is not worth the rent she's paying, especially as the rent increases come. Um, for example, the stove, the kitchen stove, none of the burners work, so she can't cook any food at home for her family. Um, and the window is broken, so it's raining and it's flooding throughout the apartment. Otro de los problemas es eh, el baño, no está funcionando. Eh, considero que creo que así ni siquiera podemos vivir y aún sin embargo nosotros hemos estado cumpliendo con los aumentos y se firmó un contrato en que ellos en cuestión de seis meses iban a arreglar el apartamento, va pasando un año. Ellos no han cumplido, sin embargo nosotros hemos cumplido hasta el día de hoy en los aumentos. Creo que hasta hoy no, no es justo, por eso estamos aquí para ver si ustedes nos pueden ayudar Eh, con este problema que nos está afectando gravemente. Uh, another issue is the bathroom. Things aren't working in the bathroom. It's no way to live. We can't even live in our own house. Um, it's a 
terrible problem to live in this apartment. Um, and that's why, a, and we've uh, paid all the, the rent increases. Part of the contract was they were going to start repairing our apartments within six months. It's been an entire year and nothing has been repaired. That's why we're here today asking for your help for this uh, unjust uh, issue. En mi caso en particular he hecho un sinfín de llamadas para notificarles el problema que tengo eh, en mi apartamento que considero que es de gran importancia e urgente y no lo que me dicen es de que les mande un email o que les mande una carta. Les escribo por email, hasta hoy en día no tengo respuestas, eh, no no hay un allegado pero ni siquiera revisar cuáles son mis problemas, no me ponen atención, entonces no tenemos de qué manera a vivir ahí, porque si no podemos cocinar, no podemos ir al baño, considero solo que, solo dormir, es lo único que podemos hacer ahí. I've called to try to report the problems that I'm having. They tell me to write an email or send a message. I write emails, I send messages, no one replies, no one comes to fix anything. At this point, all I can do in my house is sleep. I can't go to the bathroom, I can't cook, I can't do anything else. Estos son pocos de muchos problemas que tenemos, pero no quiero cansarlos con, con tantas palabras. Entonces, eh, les agradezco su atención y en verdad de todo corazón agradezco que, que nos hayan escuchado y espero que nos ayuden. Es todo. Muchas gracias. There's many more things that I could tell you, um, but I know we don't have too much time. So, I thank you very much for listening to me and to us um, and for considering our problems and being willing to help. And, and thank, uh, thank you for coming to us this evening. We much appreciate uh, uh, being better informed. So Just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else uh, on this topic? And then we can open it up more generally. Then uh, any, uh, anyone else? I, s I suspect we have one person. Uh, on a different sorry. topic. Yeah, on a different topic. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Phillips and council members. Uh, Salama Locks, uh, Commission on Aging, San Rafael representative. And to let you know that on uh, January 2nd, Mike McGuire, our California senator, will be visiting with us and talking about the 2020 priorities. And that'll be at the B Street Community Center uh, starting at 10 o'clock. Also, on February 3rd, I think we're going to be put on the agenda for bringing our our uh, second year presentation of the age-friendly San Rafael and the progress there. And third, on February 9th, also in celebration of our age-friendly San Rafael, we're going to be honoring our 90 plus, 90 plus, 90 plus um, San Rafael residents. It'll be a party. You're invited, and there'll be more to come. Let's see. It'll be intergenerational. We're going to be having the high school high school students do their community service by serving the cake and helping people be seated and so forth. And then I wanted to thank, I guess, Public Works for getting those markings at the um, post office so that people would not block the driveway there. We still do need some work at Citibank, however. Thank you. And, and thank you. And let me just uh, briefly uh, mention that I did have a telephone conversation with the, the group that spoke before uh, regarding uh, Marin Gardens. And I suggested that we would ask uh, through our city manager <coughs> that the uh, units be inspected, see if they in fact meet standards or not. And if not, we should take appropriate action. Uh, to the agreement that was entered into by uh, legal aid of Marin and the uh, new owner through their attorney, who I haven't spoken to for some time, but Jonathan Black, my name, from Walnut Creek, uh, entered into an agreement, and it's, uh, it is a non, uh, non-disclosure. So I don't know what's in that and what they agreed to, which makes it really awkward, quite frankly, for, for, for me or us collectively to respond to, uh, to a, a dispute that the that parties have. And so we'll ask our city, city attorney for some direction on uh, how best to deal with that, uh, that predicament. Uh, we may or may not be able to help since it's a private agreement and again they can't tell me what's in it so I, you know, I don't know exactly where, where to go with this thing. But uh, 
uh, I am sensitive, as I think we all are, uh, to the, the trials that uh, some of the folks are having in our community. So we'll, we'll uh, have more to talk about that uh, at a later date. Jim, do you have anything to offer? We, we talked a little bit about this issue. Mr. Mayor, uh, I'm certainly me. glad to reach out to Legal Aid of Marin, who introduced the presentation this evening mm -hmm. to try to gain more information and find out uh, what uh, the city can do right. okay. uh, to assist. Good, I appreciate that. Uh, any other comments under open session? Please. Good evening, City Council of Santa Fe. Thank you for, their, for your time this evening. My name is Cindy Salveson, and I'm here to address the issue of drag queen story time in our public library and libraries across our country. Recently, in my children's public school online announcements, three separate postings were sent out in a span of five weeks in regards to the monthly library-sponsored event drag queen story time with beef cakes for children ages two to seven. It speaks of promoting empathy in gender conforming and non-conforming children and presenting positive LGBTQ role models for children. I ask you, when did our local public library decide that this program was a benefit for our young children? How did this taxpayer funded program become promoted with so few local taxpayers being made publicly aware? I wholeheartedly disagree with this agenda of indoctrinating our youngest children into a purposefully damaging and destructive ideology. This is a program meant to groom a generation into gender confusion and turmoil under the guise of providing positive representation for gender non-conforming children. This selected demographic of children ages two to seven are young, innocent, and vulnerable, precisely the audience who will grow to be severely confused in their identities. This program encourages children to embrace the idea of adult entertainers, drag queens as role models, many of whom are associated heavily in adult sex work and classified as registered sex offenders. I ask you, who decided these were proper role models? There are many of us who are greatly offended and disturbed by this deceptive agenda that is being forced swiftly upon us. We are standing against this for our young children, future generations, and our community, regardless of whether we are labeled bigots, narrow-minded, or hateful. No government, whether local or federal, will tell me and be my moral authority in my life or my children's life, nor dictate to me my fundamental values of right and wrong. This is an assault on godly truths and values that I will not stand silent on. Thank you for your time. And thanks for, uh, for your comments and bringing to our attention your concern. Anyone else? Then we'll close. And um, I see we have someone in our audience uh, by, the, by reference to Mr. Gray. Good evening, Chief. <laughs> Jim, I think you have the uh, city manager's report. Yes, Mayor and Council, thank you. I just have one brief announcement tonight about the holiday schedule uh, of city offices. But before I do that, I was telling my son this morning that I was gonna go to the last city council meeting of the year tonight. And he said, of the decade. <laughs> <laughs> so, Stand corrected. <laughs> so I felt like I needed to take the opportunity to just very briefly um, thank the mayor and council for all the accomplishments of the year. Here we are at the last city council meeting of the year in the decade. decade. And for everything that you do to make the council so highly functioning and the organization so highly functioning. I did, though, resist the urge to come up with a long list of accomplishments because I felt like I, sh I shouldn't take the time to do that this evening. But there were just a few things that I wanted to point out that happened in the past year. There were two ribbon cuttings for, for two brand new fire stations, which was were huge for our community. Um, a ribbon cutting just last week for the Larkspur extension, which was an enormous effort of moving an arterial and rebuilding a whole intersection. And then also, as an aside, the, the sound that we're not hearing is the quiet zone that accompanied the start of the, the Larkspur extension, as was the council's goal multiple ribbon cuttings throughout the year for playgrounds and capital projects like the Grand Avenue Bridge, um, housing units approved and under construction, including hotel rooms and assisted living facilities, 
and all of the many, many hours that the council spe spent on your various subcommittees um, on all sorts of different topics like rent renter regulations, homelessness, cannabis, smart economic development, finance, essential facilities, and actually the whole list is later on your agenda tonight under the council appointments. So it's been an extremely productive year um, and I just wanted to recognize that. Uh, as we've done for the past few years, uh, the, the first meeting, the first council meeting in January, we're likely to cancel. We've been doing that um, in part because of the fact that we don't end up having a lot of city council items to bring forward at that time, um, given the, the fact that the, the time to generate those council items is the last week of December, and then also just because of a lot of holiday schedules of, of people not being available, both on the city side and also just members of the public to attend the meeting. Uh, so we'll send out an announcement um, that regarding that first meeting in January. City Hall is closed from December 24th through January 1st, but just a couple asterisks on that is that some of the, the libraries, community centers, and child care have different hours from City Hall. So it's basically the ad administrative function at City Hall is December 24th through the 1st and then check the schedules online for, for like libraries and community centers and child care. And of course, our public safety um, centers and, and all of the first responders and emergency response if we get storms and those sort of things will all be operating as usual. So I just wanted to thank the council and look forward to an equally productive 2020. Well, thanks. And if uh, in the for future reference, if you want to go on and on, that's, that's, that, that's quite all right. <laughs> But we have accomplished a lot, and I say we in the collective sense. Uh, certainly, Jim, through your leadership of, of this uh, organization and everyone involved in it, uh, deserve it. Frankly, you deserve 99% of the credit, so thanks for sharing some of that with us. Um, we'll now move on to the consent calendar, items 4A through 4E, unless someone would like to have an item held. Uh, seeing none, is there a motion with regard to the, oh, excuse me. Anyone from the public wish to address us on uh, any of these items? Close and come back for a motion with regard to the consent items. Uh, I move approval of the consent calendar. Second. Move and second. A roll call, please. Councilmember Bushy. Aye. Councilmember Collin. Aye. Councilmember Gamblin. Aye. Vice Mayor McCullough. Aye. Mayor Phillips. Aye. Matter carries 5 0. We'll move on to public hearing. We're in uh, sanitation service rates of uh, 4 2020. Nadine, you're getting a lot of uh, attention tonight. <laughs> Good evening. Yeah. Good evening, Mayor and Council. This is our annual rate setting for Marin Sanitary Service rates. And I'd like to introduce you to Garth Schultz here, who you all remember from last year, who helped us with the negotiation of the new contract with Marin Sanitary Service, including the new rate setting methodology. And we're going to quickly go through. Uh, the rate setting methodology, just to recap on some of the top items, the rate review for this year, and then I'll give you a little background on illegal dumping in San Rafael since that's a big issue, and then go over the pilot program that's being included as a recommendation uh, with this item. And then we can open it up for the public hearing. Thank you, Honorable Mayor, uh, Council members, and staff. So I'm Garth Schultz with R3 Consulting Group, presented to you around this time last year on the changes to the rate setting methodology. And here tonight, very briefly, just giving you the results of that for this 2020 rate setting year. Uh, just as a bit of a recap as to what you heard and approved last year uh, at the end of 2019 was a, a wholesale change to the rate setting methodology in the agreement with Marin Sanitary Service for the purpose of simplification, streamlining, and, and reducing cost, both to the city uh, in its participation with the Marin Franchisers Group and then also for MSS. Uh, and in large part, that resulted in uh, a set of indexed adjustment years that could go on for uh, a minimum of five years, if not longer, uh, and focusing really on controlling revenues to the company, not focusing on expenses and profit. Um, for this year, that is a success story. Uh, we told you last year in kind of forecasted models that said that, you know, largely uh, based on this external market index uh, and the changes that we've seen uh, over the past several years that your rate adjustments under the index methodology should be in the range of 4 to 5%, and we're landing squarely within that. Um, as a, a primary reminder, most of the change is tied to this external market index posted by the Bureau of Labor Statistics called Water, Sewer, and Trash CPI. 
most of the expenses or the, the kind of revenue elements that are paid by your ratepayers to MSS are tracking in line with uh, that nationwide index. There is an element that addresses fluctuations in the recycling marketplace, uh, then, and that was mostly addressed during the course of the last year, uh, kind of truing up for the impacts of the national sword. There are continued impacts uh, to the recycling marketplace. Uh, revenues do continue to decline, um, and what's based within the uh, indexed methodology for you uh, this evening, or the indexed adjustment this evening, is around a 25% change in the cost of recycling um, based on the, the indexed conditions and the actual revenues over the last year. Uh, but that's fairly de minimis in terms of the overall rate adjustment. Um, and then as a final reminder, based on what the council did uh, approve and adopt last year, um, the prior true ups that you've heard virtually every year for uh, landfill disposal, uh, recycling losses, and fuel and oil, those are, are now erased, but you are entering the second year of a three-year phase out of that. Uh, after next year's rate setting, those will be removed from the rates to the benefit of the rate payer and won't come back. This is what the result looks like for this year, um, so kind of showing you the, the high-level impacts. Overall, through the methodology, we calculated, along with the company, a 4.32% increase to rates. Uh, again, not based on, uh, primarily not based on expenses, really on this market-based index. That's the collector operations line, 2% of the overall adjustment. Um, the other aspects really are more kind of direct expense uh, uh, forecasted. The amount of garbage that goes to landfill, that's not within MSS's control, nor is the cost of tipping that uh, over at Redwood Landfill. Uh, likewise with uh, organics composting, so those are nearly a percentage of the overall total. Uh, there's an element of government fees, interests, uh, and new expenses uh, that the company is incurring due to statewide change in law, uh, small, nearly half a percent. Um, the recyclables material processing, as I mentioned, it's fairly de minimis overall, so though we saw an increase in the per ton rate as calculated through the methodology from $40 a ton to nearly 50, that's only uh, around a half a percent overall change here in the methodology. And then there is a component uh, for calculated profit. It's not a profit guarantee to the company um, within the overall um, uh, expenses that they incur. That's really within them to manage their expenses within the revenues and the profit that they would derive would be based on how they actually control their own expenses. Uh, there is an element that Corey will talk about next for uh, funding uh, uh, an illegal dumping pilot program, which is discretionary to the city council, but with the inclusion of that, you'd end up with a 4.85% increase for 2020. On your most common residential customer size of 32 gallons, it's $2 a month, moving you from $41 and change to $43 and change. And you're on the very far right-hand side of this slide. That's the city of San Rafael's rates for 32-gallon. You're slightly below the average, and this was your 2020 rate compared to primarily 2019 rates for the rest of the county. Uh, so you're slightly below the average. I'll just speak briefly to the red outliers there. Uh, West Marin and City of Nevada are legacy rates that were a part of an old agreement that's now been purchased and bought out by Recology now operating in the county. West Marin's rates are scheduled to be considered by the Board of Supervisors in January for a 30% rate increase. So that will start to normalize things and we anticipate Nevada's to change similarly sometime in 2020. And then now to Corey. Great. So, um, we receive about 200 complaints a year. I know some of you have gotten those directly on illegal dumping. It's been a big issue for the city. I've been working on it for a few years now. Um, we estimate the cost, Public Works estimates the cost about $250,000 a year when you include staff time, rental of big equipment sometimes they need to get, disposal costs and uh, associated costs. Um, what we notice is they're all going to landfill. Once something goes on the street, no matter how good it is, it's not going to get reused. It's not getting recycled. It's going to landfill. And then in terms of multifamily residents where a lot of the illegal dumping is coming from, uh, most of them don't have access to bulky weight pickups, uh, much uh, like single-family residents do. Um, so what we did was we embarked on a Together San Rafael Learning Lab project where we brought together several departments, um, including digital services, Public Works, uh, Police Department, and the City's uh, Sustainability Program, including uh, one of our interns there, and uh, tried out a few things, um, including a free bulky waste disposal event program in the canal neighborhood. So this was to address one type of dumping, and that was casual dumping, folks that don't really have access to this disposal again. And when we did interviews on the street and tried to ask people, why, you know, what do, what do you do with, with your unwanted junk? They pretty much said, well, we put it on the street because the city takes care of it, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> and we thought, well, we've got to combat that. So we put out a lot of notices, uh, both educating people about what the law is and how it's not legal, as well as giving people an opportunity then to dump their items. And we gathered a lot of data from that as well and asked people about the barriers to disposal. Um, we partnered with the Conservation Corps and the Mattress Recycling Council, so each of these events did have the opportunity to recycle things as well as repurpose things. We did have people come pick up some stuff that was still good and, and reuse it. Um, we did nine events in 2019, and then we gathered that data, which you saw in the report, as, uh, with some recommendations that actually the next intern that we had on the far right here um, put together for us. Um, and then to address some of the other issues, we um, had some conversations with the East Centerfell Working Group, and we looked at some of the other issues that are happening around Centerfell and increased some of our enforcement. Uh, police started to follow up on calls. We put together a website so people could uh, uh, report illegal dumping right away, including a, a, a phone number that went to Public Works. Um, we did a lot of education. We put together this crime prevention through environmental design tips guide and started to hand that out. And then we also offered mini grants to folks. If you can protect your property, you can upgrade your property and make it less likely to be dumped on. And if you're willing to do something like that, we were willing to give you up to $1,000 rebate. And we piloted that in East Centerfell as well. And several people took us up on that. And the outcome was that Public Works said they saw a clear reduction of illegal dumping in the canal neighborhood. So we piloted it in the canal neighborhood. So the pilot program now that's in front of you um, is to test something that we think might be even more impactful and less costly, which is the idea of providing vouchers to residents in multifamily apartment complexes so that they can take items directly to the dump when it works for them. And then commercial coupons for commercial property owners. If you report your legal dumping to us on your property and you have some evidence, you're willing to provide that evidence, we're willing to give you a voucher to be able to offload that stuff at the dump for free. And then we'll continue quarterly collection events rather than monthly. The Mattress Recycling Council is willing to provide that with us and for us uh, four times a year as well. And we can still have face time with people and, and investigate a little bit more in terms of the barriers and benefits to dumping. So this is all based on community-based social marketing, the idea that we use social science to really understand behavior change and how do, we, how do we understand what are the barriers to people actually doing the behavior we want them to do, which is to take the stuff to the dump, right? So knowledge, the solution that we're proposing here, actually instructs people that the right place to take it is to the dump. So you get a free coupon and you get to take it to the dump. Timing and storage is big. If you don't have a garage, like I do, and you need to dispose of something quickly, you gotta have something to do with it, right? So these vouchers basically give you a, a span of time that you can bring them to the dump. So it addresses that. In terms of cost, that's a big barrier too that we found out was two of the big barriers and um, free or low cost options. So we're basically saying we're gonna give you an option much like single family homes do. And then transportation is the toughest one. So we're not able to provide the transportation, although we continue to look into that. We actually tried to partner with the streets team to see if we could work out some solution. But this just provides nudges. If you have enough time, most people know somebody with a truck or a vehicle and can help you get stuff to the dump. So that's the proposal in your packet. You have a lot more information in your packet. Um, and at this point, we have like two presentations. We'll just open it up for your questions and then the public hearing, and then we can go from there. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks so much for your report, and you've had a similar report, uh, and thanks for doing so for the Economic Development Committee. <coughs> and uh, I think it's fair to say the Economic Development Committee was, uh, was in favor of what's before us this evening. In any case, questions, and then we'll open up to the public. Andrew. Andrew. Yeah, thank we're, you. We're, we're three fine. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm looking at uh, Table 1 in the staff report. Mm -hmm. It's entitled Table 1 2020 Rate Increase Factor San Rafael. And I'm trying, and what this table is useful in that it shows uh, the proposed total of 4.85% increase in the rate from last year to this year. What um, components make up that increase of 4.85%? You just described the illegal dumping program, the pilot program, and we see that that's 0.53% of the 4.85%, so I understand that. But in the other category, which is parenthetically government fees, interest, change in law, that's 0.62% of the 4.85% increase. Can, are you able to tell us with a little more specificity what those fees, interest, and changes in law are? There was a reference in your report to the um, organic recycling law that passed in Sacramento. So of that 0.62%, is most of it the organic recycling or is it really a most combination? Of it, thank you. 
Thank you, Council Member. Most of it is actually the, the government fees component, um, which is a percentage of the overall revenue requirement. So you kind of have a float, the government fees float with the overall change in revenue to the company. Um, so that's m the primary component here. Uh, interest had very modest changes, and the change in law piece here is actually quite small. We do anticipate potentially more in the future. There are two main organics changes in law that are underway. One is AB 1826, which is a requirement to commercial and multifamily uh, customers to subscribe to organics collection services. Um, and this is the, there's a very small amount of additional revenue that was proposed by the company to invest in a couple of uh, internet technology uh, tracking tools. So it's a very small overall component. There is another law, SB 1383, which is maybe the one you're thinking of, which is going to be a bit more uh, far-reaching and longer range and more impacts in future years. But at this point, uh, neither the company nor we are able to forecast exactly what those might be. And just a little more um, detail on the, you indicated that government fees float to some extent with the, um, what is it, the revenue or the operations? With the, with the revenue, exactly, with the gross revenue paid by customers. So it's a, it, they're calculated as a percentage of overall gross revenues. So if gross revenues increase, say, 4%, would fees increase 4%? It's, it's about one-to-one. -one, that's exactly right. Okay. I have no more questions. Thanks. Thank you. Um, where are we going here? No? No? Anyone? Yeah? Oh, it was a question. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> I just have a question with regard to the illegal dumping, which I think is a, is a, uh, a worthwhile feature. And I appreciate the thought that was given to this issue because I know it's, it's – uh, it's a problem for many of us, but you've addressed it in, I think, a reasonable fashion, which is better education to provide some alternatives, which uh, hopefully will be viable. However, having said that, uh, it does seem to me that um, for those that are still in violation after that further uh, that accommodation, uh, I'd like to be sure that uh, the penalties for, for uh, illegal dumping are so discovered, and it's difficult, I know, but in any case, the penalties are also uh, 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 a disincentive to do so. Are penalties in the right place or not? I don't know if they're all in the right place. I think there's a few things that happen. We do have some apartment owners or managers that are repeat offenders um, that move it off their property onto the street. Um, and so Public Works has been reaching out to them and doing administrative citations, starting with, with um, uh, you know, shot over the ballot. You know, you have an opportunity to clean this up. At some point, we're going to find you. Um, the, when it gets to be those in the middle of the night folks that we'd really like to get, that's harder to do. Um, and, and then it's harder to prosecute and all that. That said, one of the things with the mini grant program is to try to encourage more people to have surveillance cameras. The police are uh, clear that they help with other crimes as well. And when, if they're seeking the mini grant program, we ask them to also register their surveillance camera with the police department when they put it in. So we're hoping that that starts to get at that piece of it as well. Does that answer your question? It, it does, although I, I would like you to go back and, and consider the, the point again, because mm -hmm. I think after all the effort that we've gone through and the, the cost associated, <coughs> not to mention the, the clutter and the appearance, mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't mind getting pretty heavy-handed, quite frankly, mm -hmm. uh, with regard to the illegal activity. Mm -hmm. It's just not called for at all, particularly mm -hmm. since you've, and, uh, you've done a good job of uh, suggesting, uh, like I said, alternatives for those that uh, find themselves with the alt do I go to the dump? Well, here's an assist, et cetera, et cetera. So something to think about. Second, uh, the city is incurring, according to your notes, uh, about $250,000 associated with this, this problem. Mm -hmm. is there, is there, uh, was any consideration given with regard to the rate um, that we're, we're charging, 4.35 or 8.5, depending on what major point you're at, whether or not the city should recover some of that, 250 grand, through the rate structure? Um, there wasn't any specific consideration of that, no. One thing that we did a few years ago is Marin Sanitary started to pick up um, on Jacoby Street, which is one of the biggest areas of dumping, and we used to get a lot of complaints along Jacoby Street, and we haven't gotten any in probably a year now, which is really nice. Um, but we haven't put a lot of thought into that, no. Well, I think we should. Uh, quite frankly, if it's costing us two hundred fifty grand to uh, – to, uh, see to this matter without any benefit to the general public, then I do think that maybe we should recover that uh, more broadly. Um, something to think about perhaps for the next uh, uh, rates uh, setting. Go so, ahead. Mayor, we can look into it in terms of the illegal dumping pilot. 
but also just a matter of the franchise fees that we get through the agreement. Those come back and we can pay for things like general fund costs like public works. Uh, I think we're at 10% right now. And I've noticed some other cities are creeping a little higher than that now. So we could also just be taking a look at that and seeing if 10 is where we should be or should we be at 11 or something like that, which would bring in funds to cover the sort of thing that you're talking about. Perhaps you could uh, consider it in the near term rather than the long term because uh, as you know, our budget's tight as, as a, tight as a drum, so uh, let's at least consider it. John, you have a question? Yeah, just, um, I, I may have missed it, but the, the pilot program is going to run for what period? Yeah, so we hope to uh, finish it up by fall so that we can have some information for you for the next rate setting. And if, if we agree to the additional uh, percentage to cover the pilot program, if in the fall when next year when we're, we're back doing this again, we figure that it's not working the way we want it to and decide not to continue that program is that future increase um, based upon removing that extra piece or is that already going to be on you know you know, yeah you understand yeah, what i'm yeah. saying it's like if it we go up 4.85 percent this time but we decide not to do it do we remove that in the factor before we add on for next year the the model is very nimble and allows you to identify that revenue component and strip it away for 2021 should that be your desire Public comment. Anyone? Bill and then. Good evening, council Good members, evening. mayor. Uh, Bill Carney, Sustainable San Rafael. Uh, this, of course, is an annual uh, action, and it sounds like it's gone uh, fairly well this year. Um, I'm here again to request that the city move as rapidly as possible to implement the mandatory green waste uh, element that the state uh, is uh, devising uh, as rapidly as we can uh, in order to avoid the significant greenhouse gas emissions that uh, come from organic waste. Um, I'm coming this evening with renewed urgency given the failure uh, just uh, two days ago of the United Nations um, and the ongoing failure of our own national government to adequately address climate change. It really more and more is coming back to us at the local level and the government closest to us uh, to do everything we can to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so I'd, I'd like to hear how um, and when San Rafael will be implementing that mandate and suggest that we set an example uh, for the rest of Marin uh, by moving forward as rapidly as possible and not waiting for that mandate to kick in, but getting ready for it and indeed getting out in front of it. Um, per the UN, we need to decre decrease greenhouse gases by half overall in the next 10 years. That is a huge task um, in order to avoid irreversible climate change. Um, per Drawdown Marin, to accomplish that, uh, we would need to remove here in San Rafael about 10,000 tons of greenhouse gas equivalent um, uh, emissions from organic waste alone. So it, it's a significant uh, piece of work, and I would urge uh, you to ask staff and consultants uh, and Marin Sanitary to show us the path in this year so that this time next year we'll be able to begin walking down that path. Thank you. Good points, Bill. Thank you. Uh, Patty, I think you were. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Patty Garbarino. I'm a proud resident of San Rafael. Um, and I'm just here to address one item. First, I agree with Bill, and we will be um, unveiling our continued sure. green waste plan in, in an evolutionary sense. We've been doing that for a number of years. I'll ask my dad, how long ago did we roll out the green cans? At least, yeah, about 12 years ago seems like a bit longer. But I just wanted to address one item. One of the concerns last year was um, our what we don't call a succession plan because Joe and I aren't going anywhere. <laughs> it's our uh, 5, 10, and 20 year plan. So um, we are not for sale. This is too much of a kick to continue to do and serve your community, but it was important to me to also introduce my colleagues. So we have Roger Williams, 
who has been our CFO for four years and has chosen to step up and actually move toward taking care of his five grandchildren. And he will still be with Marin Sanitary Service, but um, more often from afar. Our new CFO, then, uh, Ray Holmes, is here. And Kim Shibley, who's in charge of our contracts. And Steve Rosa, who's in charge of helping us make sure that everything rolls. And Andy Buck, who's here um, uh, representing outreach and our multifamily program. And then, of course, my trusted assistant, Joe Garbarino, <laughs> is here with me. And he really hates it when I say that, so I say it at every meeting. <laughs> so thank you. We're here to answer any of your questions. And I want to thank staff very much for all of the work that went into this staff report and, and uh, the support throughout the year. Thank you. Uh, any questions of Patty? Seeing none. Um, any other public comment at this point? In which case, we'll close and come back. And I'll just comment that we have a <coughs> an annual biannual survey of uh, our services and somehow um, MSS always shows up and is very highly rated. So thanks for continuing uh, good service, uh, recognized by the community, I should add. Um, any other comments or questions? Kate? Um, I'll make a comment and then make a motion. And the staff report summed it up very well that the changes to the rate methodology have really benefited our community, and it was done in partnership with MSS. So we're really appreciative as it enables us to look at the different programs so we can get things out of landfill and where it should be. So. Uh, thank you for your continued um, vision around that. And uh, with that, I'd be happy to make a motion uh, that we adopt the resolution. And before, I, I didn't collect any any comments. If Are we I okay with that? If I could make a comment. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. Then, we'll, then yeah. we'll go with the second. And the yeah. Um, <coughs> I, I, too, want to express my appreciation both to staff, <coughs> pardon me, for the work that went into um, the effort this year, but also the uh, the uh, rate setting methodology that we accomplished last year, that was fairly significant. And then, of course, to Marin Sanders here for the work they do, not only in preparation for this evening, but also all year round. The mayor is absolutely right. Um, our constituents, our community, <coughs> your community, feel, at least as expressed in the citizen satisfaction survey, that the work that you do is valued by the community. That said, I want to register my mild concern as I, at least I react this way every year, I don't know that I register it out loud, um, that we continue to be on, our, on a cost trajectory that exceeds CPI. And I don't blame Marin Sanitary for it. I, I would say that the responsibility for it rests with all of us, in part at Sacramento and perhaps federally, but it's also the mandates that we self-impose, and I think no one more eloquently expressed it than Bill Carney when he talks about the importance for us to address climate change head on. One of the ways we do it, of course, is in how we deal with waste, and how we deal with waste is costly. It's costly in the sense that if we, according to the staff report, over the last 10 years, we've seen increases on average of more than 5%, whereas CPI has been closer to 3%. That's not sustainable in the very long run, but what we're saying as a community is that we're prepared to absorb this cost if we value the output. And I think that we do collectively, most of us do. But again, I register a note of concern that we can't do this forever. We have to find a way to turn what used to be considered a utility back into a utility and pay for it along those lines. So that said, with that concern, I would be happy to second the motion when the time comes. Uh, now would be the time I, I would comment, though. We've seen a significant, uh, and, and I agree with your comments, uh, and certainly the rate increase, but also the other factor is the, um, the uh, you know, plastics, et cetera, that in the past mm -hmm. China was willing to purchase and, and add to a revenue stream is no longer there, to no fault of anyone, certainly in this community and, and certainly not MSS. So it is, <coughs> unfortunately, a burden that uh, I think we as a community have certainly the obligation to pick up. So I agree with your comments, but there are a number of factors that go into this darn thing. Mayor Beck. What, uh, mm -hmm. Last uh, comment, of, of one of the most innovative programs that Marin Sanitary has is a partnership with the Central Marin Sanitation Agency, the Food to Energy Program. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that program takes waste and turns it into something I increasingly valuable, um, in, 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 and that is electricity that are, is used in Marin to, um, at, at our sewage treatment plant to um, uh, operate all our pumps. 
And that is that type of thinking, taking what, what was waste, what could go into a landfill, and turning it into something that we need and use right now is the type of innovation that we've um, seen from Marin Sanitary. Um, and we're uh, very happy to be um, partnered with you in that and many other things um, in, in, in our community. Um, shifting gears a little bit, though, back to the um, illegal dumping program, I, I'm all in favor of the carrots and all of the enticement things, but it's got to come with a stick on the other hand. And I, I'd like to see a little bit more focus on, on enforcement. With that as a final comment, I'm ready to, I guess, third. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think we have a second on the floor. <laughs> if that's your final comment, yes. we'll go to the vote. Councilmember Bushy. Aye. Councilmember Collin. Aye. Councilmember Gamblin. Aye. Vice Mayor McCullough. Aye. Mayor Phillips. I'm Matter Curie's 5-0. Thanks for joining us this evening. We'll move on to the next item, which is Dominican Sisters Convent, item B. Paul, good evening. Good evening, Mayor Phillips and City Council members. Uh, in May of 2017, the City Council took action to deny an appeal and uphold the Zoning Administrator's approval of an amendment for a use permit for the Lord's Convent at 77 Locust Avenue. What this action did was it authorized repurposing a portion of the convent, which is called the Yellow Hallway Area, a little under 2,000 square feet, which was convent uh, resident space to a single residential unit for transitional housing. And the transitional housing was intended to uh, provide a residency for two single women and their children, and the program was to be managed by, by Homeward Bound. The use permit was approved, if you may recall, uh, for a two-year period. That's what was requested by Homeward Bound and the, uh, the, the Lord's Convent. And, um, it was also structured that if there were any future changes to this use, it would return to the City Council, which is why we're here this evening. We, uh, the use has been in operation now for over two years, and it's been requested that the uh, use permit um, allow this to extend uh, in, uh, uh, in an indefinite period of time, no nothing specific. Staff fully supports this proposal. It's been a very successful program. We have not received any complaints. There had been a lot of concerns that there might be complaints, issues with uh, a number of things, uh, and uh, there have been none of those, which is great. I do want to mention that we did receive a letter today from Chris Dolan, a neighbor um, who has been involved with this project, and he has asked for uh, some minor change in uh, use permit condition four, uh, replacing the term in perpetuity uh, with some other language. Uh, we reviewed that language. We're fine with that change. Uh, we have also consulted with the applicant, and we understand that they're, they're fine with that change as well. So with that, I'll close, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to respond to them. Uh, questions of staff? Yes. Uh, Andrew. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, my only question is going to be on the letter from Mr. Dolan. And well, if everybody's addressed it, then. Well, no, but actually mine's on the letter, too. But uh, specifically, I read his letter, and I found it interesting. And actually, I agree yeah. with the, the um, point that he makes, but I actually di I disagree with his proposed remedial language. Um, I think that um, we should strike out the two words in operation. My concern being that should the operation discontinue or cease for a brief period of time, then this particular use might lapse or the right to it would lapse. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's the intention here. So to allow the use to continue indefinitely is one thing as opposed to in perpetuity. But to have it lapse for there being no tenants there for a period w would be unfortunate. Uh, John, did you have a comment? Yeah. No, I have one. That, that, that makes sense. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't see that. Um, that does make sense. I guess to your to clarify for what you're saying, Andrew, is that this goes on for the next five years, and there's there's tenants in there. Everything is good, and there is a period where there is no tenants, be it two months, three months, or whatever. And if that's in there, then the whole request would have to come back again, even for a short period of time. I don't think that's the intent. I don't think I don't think that's the intent, but that's correct. The language but that's that it that's reads. the risk in having the language read that way. 
Do you have any comments? Uh, we just received a letter, and frankly, I just glanced at it. I, I've been a little bit busy here, so I haven't really had a chance to <laughs> incorporate the, the thinking. Um, any comments with regard to No, there's to nothing more to it than what was just discussed. And so your recommendation, therefore, is? that That's fine. With the change that's proposed, in fact, we handed out a revision to Condition 4 that includes this. And uh, when the time comes, if uh, the Council chooses to eliminate the words in operation, uh, we can consider that at that time. And with regard to, just so we're clear on this, um, with regard to the recommendation, are you okay with that or not? You are? Okay. Further comment before we go public? Anyone from the public wish to address us on this item? Mayor and Council Members, my name is Chris Dole, and I believe you received a letter that I wrote. We did. I was the main concerned individual from the last time around, and I want to say I've got great neighbors. There's been no problem whatsoever that's arisen from this. Uh, it's been a good partnership. I think the sisters in Homeward Bound, I mean, as far as I know as a neighbor, the most contiguous neighbor, we don't even aware that it's happening. So I wish to come back and say that my concerns were perhaps unfounded. Uh, they were at that time, they were important to me, but they've not manifest themselves. And um, I thank my neighbors and Homeward Bound for being such good partners in making this happen. Uh, I did request this one change, and I certainly understand the concern of the council member, and I think there's no problem from my point of view with that, if there's none from the sister's point of view. Uh, and I wish everybody good luck, and I understand that four families have benefited. So good to you, sisters. Thank you. A good cycle, I must say. Uh, thank you for the interest you've taken in this as a next door neighbor, rightfully so, and the input you've received, and then to come back with uh, your suggestion is that's solid. So thanks, thank thanks for doing so. Anyone else wish to address us? Back uh, for further discussion, or perhaps a motion that would take into consideration the the uh, follow-up recommendation of staff. I'd be happy to make a motion if there's no comment. Okay. Please do so. Uh, I move that we adopt the resolution as revised by staff, but striking the words in operation. Second. Move and second roll call, please. Councilmember Bushy. Aye. Councilmember Collins. Aye. Councilmember Gamblin. Aye. Vice Mayor McCullough. Aye. Mayor Phillips. Aye. Matter carries 5 0. Thank, nice report. Way to go. Way to go. Uh, 5 uh, Following. <coughs> Following up on that, we have other agenda item number 6A, Public Safety Bargaining Unit side letters extending the current memorandum of understanding. <coughs> Mayor, I think we have one more public hearing of the speed limits on third, on three streets. What oh, did I miss something? Say it. What do we have? <laughs> Okay, in any case, uh, sorry, it was something on my agenda, but so be it. Uh, change the speed limit on third streets. And I actually <laughs> copied some stuff on that. Good, e good evening. That's good. Mm -hmm. uh, good evening, Thanks. Mayor, Council, uh, Bill uh, Garrett with Public then? Works. Uh, we're here tonight to uh, uh, have a public hearing on uh, the increase of two speed limits on two streets in San Rafael and the, and the decrease of one street in San Rafael. All, uh, it's a, a decrease on West Francisco uh, and an increase on Dubois and on portions of Woodland. Uh, Lauren Devini, a uh, traffic engineer in my office, is going to make a presentation. It's very brief, and then we'll take any questions you might have. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Again, Lauren Devini with the Traffic Engineering Division down at Public Works. So the California Vehicle Code requires that an engineering and traffic survey be done every seven years in order to enforce speed zones by radar. A lot of data is collected for these, but the biggest um, and most important piece of data is that 85th percentile speed of vehicles. And that is so we avoid in setting any speed traps. Uh, WTRANS, a consulting firm, was hired last spring of 2018 and since then, 31 segments have been studied and re-verified at the same posted speed. Two became enforceable with the passing of an ordinance, which I brought to you earlier this year. 
And we're here tonight to complete the study with um, eight segments that were deferred due to the SMART construction. And three of those eight would become enforceable with the passing of the ordinance. So just a summary of the data that's collected for these surveys. That's the prevailing speeds, the daily volumes, collision records, the street width, adjacent land uses and roadside conditions that are not readily apparent to the driver. The image to the right is a screenshot of what a survey looks like. It's a lot of text, but it's, it's mostly that um, uh, the items I just mentioned. So Woodland, the 85th percentile speed came in at 30 miles an hour um, because there were not conditions not readily apparent to drivers or a collision rate. Uh, we couldn't warrant a five mile an hour speed reduction, so staff's recommending that we change the speed to 30 miles an hour to comply with the CDC. And on Dubois and Francisco West, the 85th percentile speed came in at 33 miles an hour. Um, we deal with things in five mile an hour increments, so we, our starting point has to be 35. We're able to apply a five mile per hour reduction for a higher than average co collision rate and or the pace of cars. So that brings our speed to 30 miles an hour. Um, so staff is recommending that those speeds be, speeds be changed to 30. So the next steps is staff is recommending council pass the ordinance to print for these three segments, Dubois from Irwin to Woodland, Francisco Boulevard West from Second to Rice, and Woodland from Dubois to the city limits. The second reading will be at the January 20th meeting, and if council approves, the change is publicly noticed, the signs are installed by our crews, and the posted speeds go into effect 30 days later. And I'm available for questions. Thank you. Uh, questions? Uh, Very bad. I know the result occurred on Point San Pedro Road. I assume it was because of this same analysis. And I'm wondering if you've done any um, after the fact assessment of the impact of the increase, the five mile an hour increase in the speed limit. We haven't done that, but we certainly can. Um. Can I ask for yeah. clarification? Because I know that the police department was able to ramp up enforcement afterwards, but are you asking whether we've done uh, additional speed um, studies? Right, well, speed studies and the police department's enforcement, um, collision rates, um, what happened? Um, it seems to me, as a user of Point San Pedro Road, that speeds have increased. Um, and that everyone's sort of driving a little bit faster. Has that manifested itself in additional collisions? Have there been any, pr have there been any problems? Or has this all gone smoothly? That would be my question. Uh, we, we will have to analyze that and get back to the council. Okay. Can, can I give a partial response? Only because this, about a year ago, I asked, you know, I asked <laughs> the police chief about this, and I believe she told me that there was, I could be making this up, I apologize, that there was a very modest increase in overall speeds, like one or two miles per hour, um, but that enforcement um, obviously was uh, increased substantially. And she gave me the number of tickets that were written, and they were in the hundreds for the first few months after the uh, new speed limit went into effect and a warning period had expired. Mm -hmm. So that's as of a year or so ago. Having said that, it's a little bit uh, off from the, the central issue of this <laughs> evening, <laughs> but uh, it's certainly if there's an interest, in, and I would suggest there probably is, that we could have that looked at and brought back, if that works for you. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Um, John. Yeah, there was, a, there was an email we received from Stephen Bing Bingham earlier today. I think all of us got it, um, and I forwarded it to you. He made some comments about the state working on some new report that's supposed to be coming out later this year. Um, in regards to this, and I didn't read it in, into too much in depth. Um, I was just wondering if you had any comment on that, whether or not, I think his, his question was, should we wait until the state finishes their findings and reports out on that, which is supposed to happen sometime next year before we do any of these changes? Uh, I, I got the email uh, just moments ago and, uh, and don't really have a lot to say about it. I would suggest that if uh, the state of California changes the way it uh, 
enforces speed limits or, or defines how speed limits should be enforced, that will certainly cause the city to take actions to support whatever the state decides to do. And if in fact there is a new methodology, we would be in, uh, interpreting and using that methodology to set speed limits in Santa Claus. So I don't see any reason not to go forward tonight with the understanding that it, it may change or may not change ultimately. Okay, any, yeah, any input? Yeah. Um, thank you for bringing this to us. I have a question about table one because there were two other segments that were bolded in the proposed speed limit but were not mentioned in the staff report. So I was curious uh, who, what background was on that and it was uh, the Los Diamos Road and then um, the Redwood Highway segment. Those were the segments that were brought to you earlier, earlier. this year. Okay, thank you. In which case, uh, anyone from the pub? <laughs> Let's see, is there any public here first? Anyone from the public wish to address us on this item? Close, come back. Further uh, comment uh, or a motion? Uh, Both would be appropriate. I'd be happy to make a motion. I guess the motion would be that we pass the ordinance to print. Thank you. Is there a second? second? Moved and seconded. Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Member Aye. Bushy. Council Member Collin. Aye. Council Member Gamblin. Aye. Vice Mayor McCullough. Aye. Mayor Phillips. Aye, Matter Carries uh, 5 0. And if you would bring back at some point in time uh, a, a follow up report on San Pedro, that would be of interest. Well, then, <coughs> I see my. Uh, other agenda items. <coughs> Item 6A, public uh, bargaining unit, et cetera. <coughs> Mayor uh, Shabani Nog is, is making her way down to give this presentation. <laughs> I just was remembering that I think this is her first presentation it in is. front of the city council. Oh. Welcome. <laughs> so We're a hard um, crowd. We're we'll let crowds. her know that it's time <laughs> to do her 30 minute bio before she begins. <laughs> and <laughs> no, you can jump right in. Well, good evening. Good evening, Mayor. We, we promise not to bark too loud. <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, as, as background, in late 2018, the city entered into two-year contracts with our four public safety bargaining units from July 1st, 2018 through June 30th, 2020. I'm here tonight to inform you that the city and uh, each of these respective bargaining units have reached tentative agreements to extend their MOUs by one year through June 30th, 2021. Staff is recommending that job classes represented by these four units receive a 2% base wage increase in the first pay period, including July 1st, 2020, and a 2% equity adjustment in the first pay period, including January 1st, 2021. These increases are equivalent to a 3% increase over the next fiscal year, which is consistent with the Bay Area November 2019 CPI index. From uh, just a brief note from people impacts from human resources, uh, from a people and a workforce perspective, compensation is just one aspect of total employee experience, along with other components such as work-life effectiveness, talent development, and diversity programs. As we continue to build ongoing partnerships with our bargaining units, the HR team remains focused on these other components as well and around employee engagement and experience and is uh, dedicated towards uh, culture change and, and some new, new fresh ideas to bring to the city. In summary, our, our public safety employees are a critical driver to our community's daily safety and well-being and their specialized skill set is proving to be difficult to both recruit, recruit retain, engage and just really find the top talent in, in the Bay Area. It's pretty competitive. And so these tentative agreements that are reached uh, with mutually satisfactory terms will enable the city to continually acknowledge and appreciate our public safety uh, units and the employees that support us on a, on a daily basis. So I'm happy to answer any questions you have. So you've either been well coached or you're, uh, you're quite <laughs> able. Uh, probably, <laughs> probably both is my guess. Thank you for your uh, outstanding report. Any questions or comments on any of the I, 2I, 3I, et cetera, the four items before us? No. Yeah, I'll go through the routine. Anyone from the public? See no one, we'll return. And I would suggest uh, motions for each of these uh, items. It, could I make a comment, Mayor? Oh, yeah, Mayor, of course. Make a motion. Sure, sure, I, I just sure. want to say it really briefly, Shivani, thank you for the um, concise uh, uh, <laughs> and yet on point uh, presentation and report. 
Um, I'd like to say, and I suspect I'm speaking for others, that I'm grateful to the bargaining units that we're able to accomplish this so early in the process. I'm disappointed, however, as I'm sure others are too, that we're not able to do more to close what we all acknowledge to be a pay gap between our members mm -hmm. and um, that is bargaining unit members and similarly situated bargaining units elsewhere in the county, the peer groups that we look at also elsewhere in the Bay Area. But I'm hopeful that this represents a small down payment against that effort and that going forward we can do more on behalf of our employees. But again, my gratitude to bargaining units for helping us make this happen and of course to your team um, and our lead negotiator for their hard work. So with that, I'd be happy to make a motion. And I, I would uh, certainly like to agree with your, your comments. Most certainly there's gonna be more, more about this as we uh, go throughout next year, but uh, your comments are most appropriate. Thanks for offering. Uh, and motion would be a, you know, appropriate. With regard to, let's go through each one if we can. Well, okay. If we're doing them individually, then I move that we um, adopt the resolution approving the side letter with our Ch San Rafael Fire Chief Officers Association. Second. And a second roll call, please. Councilmember Bushy, second. <laughs> Councilmember Colline. Aye. Councilmember Gamblin. Aye. Vice Mayor Metella. Aye. Mayor Phillips. All right, matter carries 5 0 and uh, move we approve the resolution approving side letter with San Rafael Firefighters Association. <coughs> second. And a second roll call. Councilmember Bushy. Aye. Councilmember Colline. Aye. Councilmember Gamblin. Aye. Vice Mayor Metella. Aye. Mayor Phillips. I matter carries 5 0 and third item. I move we adopt the resolution approving side letter with San Rafael Police Association. Thank second. you. Move to second roll call, please. Councilmember Bushy. Aye. Councilmember Collin. Aye. Councilmember Gamblin. Aye. Vice Mayor McCullough. Aye. Mayor Phillips. Aye. Matter carries 5 0. Then number four. Final. Mo move we adopt the resolution approving side letter with San Rafael Police Mid Management Association. Second. Move to second roll call, please. Councilmember Bushy. Aye. Councilmember Collin. Aye. Councilmember Gamblin. Aye. Vice Mayor McCullough. Aye. Mayor, Mayor Phillips. Uh, I and that matter uh, also carries 5-0. Thank you very much. Excellent report. We'll move on to 2020 Vice Mayor. I think there's a report on this, or how do we deal with this? Is it just a it, nomination, or what do we do? It, well, if there's no actually formal report, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to, <laughs> and I know that I've spoken more than my fair share, but I would like to make a motion on this matter. Please do. Yes, I move that we select the vice mayor as set forth in the staff report on the attachment for 2020, and that vice mayor would be Kate Collin. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Move and second. Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Bushy. Aye. Councilmember Collin. Aye. Councilmember Gamblin. <laughs> <laughs> Aye. Vice Mayor McCullough. Uh, I, I, I willingly <laughs> give up my position and vote aye. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Phillips. And I'm more than willing to have the substitution. Uh, aye. <laughs> Matter carries 5 0. <laughs> Mr. Mayor. There you go. Mr. Mayor, point of order. Uh, I was expecting some order. sort of a report on the achievements of the Vice Mayor. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's too <laughs> expensive. We would be out of here at midnight, so let's not do that. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to wait to read They're that. They're legendary. The, They're uh, legendary. I'll, I'll just simply report that it was a pleasure. Uh, working this year closely with the vice mayor along with other council members of course but specifically the vice mayor uh added an awful lot and i am greatly appreciative to be associated with uh, former vice mayor andrew mccullough <laughs> with that we'll turn on uh, turn to the 2020 city council appointments any comments maybe you've all seen this public no back motion I move that we adopt the list of city council appointments as set forth in the staff report. Second. Moved and second roll call, please. Councilmember Bushy. Aye. Councilmember Collins. Aye. Councilmember Gamble. Aye. Vice Member Collins. Aye. Mayor Phillips. Aye, and that better also carries 5 0. Not a lot of dissension tonight. Thank you, everyone. Will there be council member reports? Oh, I guess, yeah, probably. Any, uh, any reports by any of the council members? I know we've all been do busy doing various things. So uh, with that, we, uh, we are adjourned.